Welcome, friends, to another edition of Global Capitalism, live economic update, a presentation brought every other month, brought by Democracy at Work, the host organization, in cooperation with the Left Forum, who together produce and present to you these lectures. Today is in honor of Labor Day, which happens the first Monday of September in the United States. And I wanted today's presentation to talk about a resurging U.S. labor movement. I want to talk about what it is, why it's happening, what it is doing in rethinking the strategy, the goals, and what the next steps are to build on the remarkable resurgence that has occupied the last two to three years. First, why do I call it a resurgence? Well, let's be clear. It's across the board in the United States. It goes from low-paid service workers all up to the highest paid skilled workers, and pretty much every industry is experiencing one form or another. The two major pieces of evidence are the drive to unionize workers who weren't in a union, didn't have a union, or the determination to go on strike, to use that fundamental weapon of the working class uh, in its effort to get decent wages and working conditions. I am now going to give you just a surface smattering of all of the signs of a labor resurgence. I want to start with the chain of coffee shops, Starbucks, kind of remarkable story. A huge corporation, very profitable, located not only across the United States, but in many other countries. Proud, at least here in the United States, of having blocked, prevented, avoided unionization, thereby able to get away with imposing working conditions and wages on the people who work in their shops that are now no longer tolerated by those workers. It was in the year 2020 in British Columbia up in Canada that the first group of workers in a Starbucks shop made a union, fought for a union, won a union at their workplace. It wasn't until over a year later, toward the end of 2021, that for the first time in Buffalo, New York, another group of Starbucks workers fought for, got a union election, and prevailed, won that election to establish a union. Let me read to you the statistics of what has happened in the less than two years since that first successful unionization effort at Starbucks in Buffalo, New York. As of now, 448 Starbucks stores in 46 of the 50 states of the United States have filed to unionize, collecting signatures from their workers. 322 Starbucks stores in 42 states have won union elections. 81 of those elections were lost, a ratio of four to one winners to losers in Starbucks. I could go on, but I think the point is clear. Let me jump to something very different. Medical doctors long resistant to any effort to unionize them, are now unionizing all over the country. Several hospitals in Queens, New York, have now organized with the Committee of Interns and Residents, a union working with SEIU, a major international union here in the United States. Boston doctors, the three public Hospitals in the L.A. area, likewise, doctors all over the country unionizing. Let me take another example. 
strippers at a strip club in North Hollywood pioneered. They were the first group of strippers to want and file for and get a union. And they recently were joined by the second group of strippers, this one at the Magic Tavern in Portland, Oregon. Wow. Let me continue. Auto workers, the UAW, confronting the big three auto companies in Detroit. The Teamsters, who won an extraordinary increase in wages at the UPS company with hundreds of thousands of workers involved. Public employees, music workers at YouTube, employees at Microsoft, Alphabet, Google, and so on. High-tech workers, low-tech workers, journalists remarkably doing this around the country. And I want to end my survey, and I have not the time to go through it, but I want you to see we're talking millions of workers moving and responding when other workers make that decision to do likewise. I want to pick out one relatively small one because you're going to see what this group of workers did is becoming a pattern that is going to shake not only the labor movement in this country, but this country as a whole. San Francisco Bay Area, 125 years, they've had the Anchor Brewing Company, went through various names and ownerships, but became a staple for beer drinkers in the Bay Area and beyond. Anchor Steam, it was often known as. Well, a few years ago, they were purchased by a huge conglomerate, and they were run into the ground, and the workers at first reacted, watching the threat to their livelihoods of the way this conglomerate managed, I'm using that word, with a certain tongue-in-cheek, this brewery, known as the Anchor Brewery. So the workers decided to join a union. Yeah, part of this very process I'm talking about, a few years earlier. And they decided to join a union famous for its militancy, the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union the union that represents the dock workers up and down the West Coast, from California to Oregon and Washington, and into Canada as well. And they joined the union. And in retaliation, or at least that's the suspicion, the conglomerate decided to shut down the brewery. After 127 years, Anchor Brewery shut down, and then the workers decided to do something else. They decided they weren't going to let the company destroy their livelihoods, destroy what that company meant to the neighborhood, to the city of San Francisco, to the people who had enjoyed the beer. It's good beer. I've had it myself. And so they decided to do something, and we're going to come back to this. The workers are going to buy the company. They're raising money, and they've raised many thousands already. They're working with a variety of organizations that now exist precisely to help workers do this because it's happening all over the country. Workers becoming their own bosses. Workers becoming not only the employee, but the employer at the same time. They're overcoming the employer-employee division that characterizes, or maybe I should better say haunts, every other enterprise in most of the industries of this country. But movement in that direction is happening, and I'm going to come back to that as we proceed. So let me turn next to answering a kind of obvious question. Why is that resurgence happening now? Why are workers now doing the kind of militant movement, demanding unions, going on strike, etc., etc.? Why? 
Well, as with all major social movements, the answers are plural. There's many factors that come together. It's never one or two things. So let me go through some of the major ones. First, we are living at a time, and we have been for the last half century, from the 1970s to today, a time of growing, rapidly growing, extreme inequality in the United States. We have been living through a redistribution of wealth and income from the bottom and the middle to the top. That's why we have the Jeffrey Bezoses and the Elon Musks and the people with more billions of dollars than they know what to do with, looking for amusements while a growing number of people cannot do what we used to call enjoying a middle-class lifestyle, achieving the American dream, or whatever you called it. Our middle class has been eviscerated, weakened, deprived, assaulted from every side. As the joke goes, too much month at the end of the money. The second factor that is provoking and developing our labor movement resurgence was the pandemic. You know, the pandemic had a number of interesting shocks that were administered to all of us. Number one, all kinds of workers were told that they were, and I quote, essential. They were the people who kept this country going during a time of terrible sickness, death, and the threat of dying or getting very sick. They're the ones who couldn't stop working because they operated the food supply, the transportation system, the production of basic goods and services, including those that kept you healthy or safe all the medical people and all the food services who provided what you couldn't anymore get if you sat down in a restaurant because it was too dangerous. These people, many of whom are paid very poorly, were told that they were essential. And for a moment, the working class in America understood that it is essential that what keeps this society going is the army of working people who get up every day and go to work eight hours, putting in their time, using their brains and their muscles to make the system work. And when the pandemic was over, suddenly no more talk about them being essential. If they went back to work because their jobs were interrupted, it was work as usual. It was as if the essential was no longer to be considered that. The government stopped helping people get through a hard time. No one cared anymore. Getting through a hard time without a pandemic turned out not to be on the agenda of the United States and workers felt aggrieved. Suddenly workers, and this is the third factor, suddenly workers understood when the supports of the pandemic, you're essential, we're going to help you out. You don't have to pay your rent. You don't have to repay your college loan. We're going to help you out because we can because we're a rich enough society to do it. All of the help we gave you, we're taking back. We don't want to give it to you just because you need it. We only want to give it to you in a dire emergency. You know what it did? It made the working class of America think. And they began to think about the last 23 years. You know, we're in a new century, 21st century, and there are 23 years We've had. And I want to review what the working class has actually gone through in those whole 23 years. 
And that's what was happening in people's minds, thinking about this. So here we go. We've had three economic crashes in these 23 years. At the beginning, in the year 2000, we had what is called the dot-com crash. The stock market fell apart. All the high-flying, high-tech companies' shares collapsed. And we had serious trouble, not just on Wall Street, but spreading through the economy. A few years later, in 2008 and 9, we had an even bigger crash, came to be called the Great Recession. Millions of people lost their jobs. Hundreds of thousands of enterprises went belly up, bankrupt, finished. Terrible unemployment, terrible suffering, lives interrupted, educations interrupted. And then we had a third one. In 2020, a collapse of our economy. We call it the pandemic or the COVID collapse, but calling it by that name doesn't change. It was the third economic collapse in the 23 years of this new century. And it really walloped the American working class. To give you an example, in the period 20 to 21, 2020 and 2021, Half of the American working class experienced some amount of unemployment. For some, it was just a few weeks. For others, it was the whole year, year and a half. Half of your workers lost their jobs, many of them not knowing whether they'd ever get them back or if they got them back under what conditions, at what rate of pay. The anxiety alone that this produced was a staggering blow. So we have an American working class whacked by three collapses in 23 years and all that goes with them. But I'm not done. Before the pandemic was over, the working class was hit with an inflation, rising prices. And let's be real clear here the prices rose by all measures, more than wages did. If you didn't have a wage increase at all, you were simply stuck with paying higher prices. If you were among the few who got a wage increase, it wasn't big enough to keep pace with the prices. If you were a minimum wage worker, and let's remember the minimum wage in the United States, $7.25 an hour. That was last raised in the year 2009. It's now 2023. 14 years. Every one of those years, prices went up. In the last few years, they went up a lot. But what did we do as a nation for the people on the minimum wage of $7.25 an hour? Our politicians, Republican and Democrat alike, Trump, Biden, Bush, all of them, they didn't do anything. And those in Congress, neither, no matter who ran the government, they didn't help the people on the minimum wage. And an inflation hurt everybody, except, of course, the people who set prices. They were raising their prices. And because I'm an economist, I need to remind everyone, who sets prices in the United States? Let's be really clear. Employers do. It's not the job of employees to determine the price of what they help to produce. They're not allowed to do that. Employers don't call employees in to participate in deciding what to charge for whatever it is they help to produce. No, no, no. The employers keep that to themselves. It's an employer's prerogative. Hmm. And what's the percentage of employers in our population? Well, there's an argument among statisticians. Some think it's about 1%. Others say, no, it can be as much as. 
So let's be clear what an inflation is. That's when 1% to 3%, the employers, decide to raise prices that the other 97% of the people have to pay. There's nothing democratic about an inflation. There never was. It is the autocracy of the employer class that imposes inflations. Just like it's the pattern of investments and spending that gives us the crashes in 2000, 2008, and 2020. And now that we've had a year and a half of inflation, what have they decided to do about the inflation? Jack up interest rates faster and further than we've ever seen before. Well, you know who's hurt by rising interest rates? People in the middle and poor who can't afford them. Just like who's hurt by the inflation? People in the middle and the... This is so unfair, so grotesque, and it comes after decades of a redistribution of wealth from the bottom and the middle to the top. It's really too much, isn't it? if you see it and you understand it. And that's why workers are now moving. They're seeing it. They're feeling it. They're experiencing it. And they don't like it. Here's another reason for a resurging labor movement. Very important. And it's in a peculiar way, the one you get some public relations, some mainstream media talking about. They talk about it as, quote unquote, a tight labor market. Here's what that means, that the unemployment rate is low. Historically, we have three and a half, four percent of our people unemployed, and that's less than we usually have. Capitalism isn't good at getting full employment, never has been. So, why might it be a little lower than usual now? Well, the answer is prices having gone up more than wages, people at the top being able to hire people at the bottom at wages that have not gone very far and not as far as the prices they charge, it's now interesting for them to hire workers to say the same, the same thing in simple English. The ratio between what you have to pay a worker and what you can charge for what that worker produces for you, that ratio has become very favorable to the employer. So they hire lots of people. It's the message capitalism has always given to the working class. You want a job? You work for me for next to nothing. You push your wages up? I react by threatening to take away your job. It's not fair. It's not just. It's got nothing to do with democracy, but it is the reality, the harsh reality. We have low unemployment because we've driven down the wages. That's why people who have a job discover that even if you have one, you're constantly sweating your financial situation because the relationship between the wage you get and the prices you pay means even with a job, you're always under stress and pressure. So workers are reacting to all of these things and demanding a better deal from the employer. They're demanding a better deal from the economic system we live in. And they're forming unions in the hopes that that will help them do better. And it usually does. All the statistics show unions earn higher wages for their workers than the same workers get working for places where there is no union. That's why employers work hard to keep unions away. The National Labor Relations Board, even the New York Times, denounced Starbucks for all of the unethical, illegal, semi-legal efforts they went to to stop the unionization. They spent a lot of money. It didn't succeed because of these factors that I've just talked about. 
What are labor's goals in this resurgence? What does the labor movement want? Well, the first thing it wants is to reverse 50 years. It's actually even longer, 60, 70 years of decline. 60, 70 years ago, a third of American workers were represented by a union. Today, it's about 10%. And the line of decline has been almost continuous over the last 50 years. So that's a, fam- a basic demand to reverse the decline of the labor movement. A second goal is to motivate workers to use the weapons they have at their disposal. And by weapons, I mean the tools with which to fire or fight the employer. After all, employers have a lot of weapons. They can take your job from you. That's a big one. They can change, often by any whim they have, the conditions of your job. They can change the pay you get or don't get for your job, the benefits you do or don't get for your job. You understand the employer has no end of weapons to use, which they do use. Workers have many fewer. But one of the most important is to withhold their labor. That's when the employer realizes that you may be having a nice office, a nice factory, a beautiful store, but without the people working, it's not worth anything to you. It's just a lot of bricks and wires and paint. Everything depends on the worker and the work. But the strategy that labor is going to use to reverse the 50 years of decline to motivate people to recognize and use the weapons they have, such as the right to strike. That means something is going to have to be done, which more and more workers are understanding. And this is a kind of understanding of their history. And I need to take five minutes with you to go over that history so you can understand what workers are coming to understand that is motivating their resurgence. After World War II, it became very difficult to be a union in the United States. That's why pretty much since the end of World War II, unions have declined. Yeah, they've been attacked by business, but they'd been attacked by business before. Employers don't like unions, and that's not new. But employers upped their anti-union efforts and involved the government to help them squash the labor movement after 1945. And we have to understand it because it's going to determine whether the resurgence grows and becomes more powerful how it grows, and what it's going to do to all of us living in the United States. So here we go, brief history. The great achievements of the 1930s were the peak of the American labor movement. Suddenly, in a matter of four or five years, an organization formed by a union the union in question, the United Mine Workers, the miners, formed an organization called the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. And in a few years, in the depths of the depression of the 1930s, the CIO, led by the United Mine Workers, organized millions of Americans who had never been in a union before, whose parents had never been in a union, to join a union. And they did so because the Depression was an awful time of suffering for millions of people, and they saw joining a union as one of the few ways they had to get through this awful time. How did those millions come to join the CIO? The answer was a powerful alliance between the labor unions in the CIO, the mine workers, and so on, 
and the following three organizations, two socialist parties and a communist party. These were powerful parties back then, with tens or hundreds of thousands of members here in the United States. And an alliance was formed, often called the New Deal Coalition. An alliance was formed between the unions and the communist and socialist parties. And they went to the then president of the United States, a centrist democratic politician, the equivalent then of what Clinton or Biden or Obama are these days. And they went to him and they said, this depression is really destroying the American working class. You have to do something about it. And the message that everyone in the room understood, even though they didn't say it, was, we voted for you, Mr. Democratic President. And if you don't do what we need you to do to help the American people, we're not going to vote for you again. And you're not going to be the dog catcher in Milwaukee, let alone the president of the United States. President Roosevelt wasn't stupid. He understood what was being told to him. This time it wasn't a corporation dangling a donation. It wasn't a rich person dangling a donation. It was millions of people dangling the fact that they would listen to the Socialist Communist Party and or the CIO and vote. So guess what we got in record time, three or four years? The Social Security System. Suddenly, the government decided it would help people who had given a lifetime of work to this society. When you reach the age 65, you will get a check every month for the rest of your life, no matter how long you live. That's our response to what you did. It said to every American, you're not now going to have to take care of your elderly parents the way you thought you would have to. To the older workers, it said, we're not abandoning you when your employer decides you're no longer a profitable employee, etc. Who got that? The socialists and the communists and the unions. Number two, the first time the government passed a minimum wage. Before that, there was no minimum. Employers could get away with paying worker anything that that worker would accept. Number three, They developed the unemployment compensation system. If you lose your job through no fault of your own, the government will give you a check every week for half a year, year, year and a half to get you through and enable you to find other work. And number four, 15 million unemployed people were offered a job by the federal government. As the president said, if the employers of America will not give you a job, I, as president, will. I'll give you a job. I'll give you a decent wage or salary. You'll be able to make payments to keep your home. You'll be able to feel good about yourself. That's what was accomplished by the alliance of socialists, communists, and unionists putting their pressure on the president. And how was this paid for? That's the best part. Roosevelt went to the corporations and the rich of America, and he said, I have to give something to the working people of America to get them through this depression. But I don't have any money because the government's not raising much in the way of taxes, because millions of people are unemployed, earn nothing, and don't pay anything. And millions of companies are in deep trouble. They're not paying taxes either. So the only way I can do something for the mass of people, which, by the way, we better do, because if we don't, they're going to make a revolution here, because some of those socialists and communists were talking about revolution then. So. Roosevelt went to corporations and the rich and said, you're the only ones who have money. 
you're going to have to give me a big chunk of your money so I can provide help to the mass of the American working class. And he said, I advise you, gentlemen, because in those days, very few women were in those rooms. I advise you, gentlemen, to give me some of your money, because if you don't, there's going to be a revolution and you're not going to have any money left. He persuaded enough of them. All of them? No, but enough of them. And so he got, he raised the taxes on corporations. He raised the taxes on the rich by a lot and got the money to pay for Social Security, unemployment compensation, and the wages and salaries of the 15 million people the federal government hired and employed. Wow. When anyone tells you we can't tax corporations and the rich to take care of the mass of people, please remember your history. Of course we can do that. We've already done that as a nation. Been there, done that. The only question is, can we mobilize to get that done again? Well, when the war ended, World War II, and President Roosevelt died, happening about the same time, the business community went on a tear. They had seen what for them was the worst world in the imaginable, a government they didn't control, but that was controlled, heaven forbid, by the mass of people organized in two socialists, the Communist Party, and the CIO. This could never be allowed to happen again. And so the business community mobilized the government, which in the end, it still controlled, recaptured whatever parts of the government it didn't control, and went to work to undo the New Deal, to reverse what had happened. And they knew what they had to do to destroy the New Deal coalition. And how did they do it? First, they went after the communists, destroyed the Communist Party, called it not the organizer of the unionization of America, which is what the party had mostly done, and redefined them as evil agents of the evil Soviet Union. Interesting, the evil Soviet Union, which had been the ally of the United States against Hitler in Europe, against the Japanese in Asia, Uncle Sam and Uncle Joe Stalin working together. But no, we rewrote everything after World War II, and the communists were destroyed. And when they were finished with them, they destroyed the two socialist parties. And when they were finished with them, they went after the labor movement. And the last 50 years of decline of the labor movement have been the result of the continuous effort of the business community and the government to do that. And that's in the end why we could have, over the last 30 to 40 years, a redistribution of wealth and income from the bottom and the middle to the top. It was undoing the New Deal. It was reversing what had happened by destroying what? The alliance between the workers and the social community around the worker. You know who made that alliance in the 30s? The socialist and communist parties. They gathered students, teachers, professionals, all kinds of people, housewives, everybody, to ally with the workers. When the workers went on strike in Detroit or in Flint, Michigan, the auto workers, the community, brought them the food they needed for their sit-down strikes when they sat down on the machines. Who would bring them water? Who would bring them food? The company wouldn't. The police wouldn't. You know who did? The women. They organized the community. And you know who organized the women? The communist and socialist activists in many cases. 
What then happened was that the unions shrank, but more important, they lost their alliance with the larger community. Now they had to go it alone against the employer. They could barely coordinate among themselves, but there was no socialists to work with them. There were no communists to work with them. They couldn't mobilize public opinion, the larger community, the churches, the youth groups, all of it, the students. Nobody would do it for them, and they weren't strong enough to do it for themselves. What alliances were left? Only one. The alliance between the working class, the labor movement, and the Democratic Party. An alliance built because the president in the Great Depression of the 1930s was a Democrat, Franklin Roosevelt. And so he was seen as a friend of this labor plus socialist plus communist party. So the working class voted Democratic. And so the business and government realized they have to change that, not just destroy the communists and the socialists, not just weaken the labor movement, but weaken the pro-labor nature of the alliance between the labor movement and the Democratic Party. And the way that was done was by bringing big donations to the Democratic Party from the business community. By a change of loyalty, so that the Democratic Party would be split. Half of them would continue to be friendly with the labor movement. You want to see who those people are? That's Bernie Sanders. That's AOC. That's them. And the other part, that's the center. Obama, Clinton, Biden. They don't want to lose the donations. And if you're getting donations from the employer, you just can't quite do it for the employee. That's why Clinton and Obama and Biden never had a government jobs program for the unemployed. Didn't do what Roosevelt did. They didn't raise the minimum wage, let alone create new supports for the working class. No. They made sure that the alliance between the labor movement and the Democratic Party became useless. Didn't help the working class which is why it became possible from Reagan through Trump for the other party to have a way of going to the working class and saying, the Democrats, yeah, they may have done something for you back in the 1930s, but not only have they been unable to build on that and bring you more, they haven't even been able to protect what you got in the 30s. That's why the minimum wage doesn't even keep pace with the cost of living. That's why during the unemployment of the three crashes in the last 23 years, no leading centrist Democrat said a word about a government jobs program, which they could have and they should have, if only to do what worked so well for Roosevelt. All of this is leading not only to the resurgence of labor, but very importantly, to the resurgence of the need for alliances. In the struggle against Starbucks, the students at Cornell University mobilized to punish the Starbucks Corporation for abusively treating its workers. That's a worker-student alliance. The United Auto Workers, as it has been gearing up for the strike that they are expecting at the end of their contract, which ends on the 14th of uh, September, they're working closely 
with community organizations in Detroit and elsewhere. That's right. The labor movement has understood it needs to rebuild the kind of coalition that won all those things in the 30s. They're beginning to understand that the reason you don't have a Roosevelt today, the reason that Obama wasn't and Clinton wasn't and Biden wasn't, was because you don't have any way to force that. It was forced on Roosevelt, but the coalition of labor, socialists, and communists is gone now because the socialists and communists have been purged out of American culture. Oh, they're there, but they're not organized in parties. It's become made too difficult for them. So the labor movement has to reach out to particular movements, anti-racism movements, anti-sexism movements, ecological movements, and so on. And it's doing that, but it's slow, it's haphazard. One of the virtues of the socialist and communist parties was they brought these kinds of social movements under their own umbrella, unified them so that you could make a unified coalition with the CIO, and so on. I want to conclude by talking about a new direction emerging in the labor movement, which is part of its resurgence and yet something new, because every resurgence of the working class always builds on what went before, tries to learn lessons on what went before, tries to use what worked in the past, but also to accommodate new conditions, new situations, new circumstances. And this takes me back, as I promised I would, to the Anchor Brewing Company in San Francisco. They tried to carve out a decent life for the workers at that brewing company without a union. It didn't work. They formed and joined the Longshoremen Workers Union, which helped. But the conglomerate punished them by closing or threatening to close. So they had to come up with another plan. Close it, the union, in effect, told the employer. Go ahead. We'll reopen it without you. We'll make it a worker cooperative. It'll preserve our jobs. It'll preserve our dignity. It will preserve the benefits to the Bay Area that come from the work we do and the product we produce. We don't need the employer to do what the rest of us need. We, the workers, are the majority. Employers are a small minority. We don't need them. We never did. It's a kind of aha moment for the labor movement. The way this will work allows me to tell you an imaginary story, but not imaginary in the sense that it never happened. It is happening as I speak. It's been going on for a while. Here's how it works. You sit down with the employer and you say, we need better wages, we need better working conditions, and you bargain. That's called collective bargaining. And if you're lucky, the employer will meet you halfway, more or less, sign a contract, and you'll get better wages and working conditions. That's what's been going on in the Starbucks Corporation, despite the unwillingness of the Starbucks employers to come along. They've had no choice. If the workers strike, as they often have, Starbucks stops. But let's suppose the employer doesn't meet you halfway. Suppose the employer threatens, as happens a great deal, we're not going to give you a better wage. We're not going to improve your working conditions. And if you push us, we'll shut the place down. At that point, workers usually are terrified. The union leaders and negotiators come back to a meeting of the workers and explain, well, we can push, 
we can maybe strike. But here's the problem. We we're going we can call their bluff, the employer's bluff, but maybe they're not bluffing. Maybe and many, many a union, I've been at those meetings, has decided to reduce their demands or give up their demands or end their strike or forego their strike for fear that the employer will use that weapon. And the more the employer is a big corporation with many things going on, which is exactly what happened to Anchor Brewing, big corporation, Sapporo Corporation, if you're interested ready to shut down this small unit of the big corporation, the more dangerous this is. But now the workers realize they have another option. They've always had it, but they didn't think, they weren't driven, they weren't provoked, they weren't angry, they didn't have all the conditions I've just described to bring this idea to the fore. Look across the table when you get threatened and say to the employer, go ahead, shut the factory. But let me tell you what's going to happen to you if you do. Number one, we're going to go to every politician in this area, mayor, congressperson, senator, and we're going to say, this corporation is damaging this community by shutting down this enterprise. It won't pay taxes anymore. The people will be unemployed. The land will go down in value. The neighborhood will deteriorate. We're going to make sure the media hear about it and every politician hears about it. You're going to take a blow to your reputation, the likes of which you've never seen. Because we're going to tell everybody everywhere. Number two, we're going to go to those same politicians and we're going to say, we need your help, Senator Jones or Mayor Smith. We need your help to provide us with the money and the support and the tax forgiveness and six other things that will help us as workers buy out this employer corporation so that we can take over and convert this enterprise and thereby keep it here, keep it going, keep the jobs, keep the incomes, keep the taxes paid. And we're going to say to the whole community, you're the politician who helped us do it. And it's going to be really good for you. And if you don't do it, we're going to tell everybody you didn't, that you let this community down, you undid the jobs, the incomes, the taxes. What kind of a political leader are you? So there's a lot in it for you to help us and a lot in it for you to avoid by not helping us. And then we're going to go to the churches and all the community organizations and say, we offer you a deal. Help us. Help us convert this business into a worker co-op. And we guarantee that we will be there to help you. Are you fighting against racism in this community? We will be there with you. Are you partisans of a Me Too movement in this area? We'll be there with you. You want to see working people support environmentalism? We... we we're not doing it out of charity. We're not even doing it out of necessarily agreeing with you. But we understand solidarity. You were there with, we were making our move. We'll be there for you. You know what this is about? This is rebuilding the kind of alliance that the New Deal had. There's no end to what can happen if we have an alliance between labor unions on the one hand, and worker co-ops as partners. If you can get a better deal as a union, get it. But if you're threatened with retaliation, close the business, you have a weapon you didn't know about, a weapon that builds an alliance you can use 
in the years to come for all kinds of gains. The labor movement is figuring out that it needs this. If all you do, and this is the conclusion I want to leave you with, if all you do as a labor movement is get a better deal, better wages, better working conditions, then you're left with the awful worry. I fought hard. My union did. We won the contract. We got a wage increase. But the worry will be nagging at you that the employer who you had to fight with to get it is already at work figuring out how to take away from you what you just forced him to give you. And you're worried for a good reason. The history of the New Deal is exactly that. Heroic struggle, tremendous victories, and then the undoing afterward. And one way to prevent that from happening is if you're no longer dealing with an employer across the table who has fundamentally different interests from yours. How different it will be if the employer you're facing is actually your mirror. It's you, because that's what a worker co-op is. The worker and the employer are the same people. You're not going to do to yourself what the employers have shown themselves ready, willing, able, and determined to do. All of these ideas are roiling around in the minds of millions of American workers as they move politically and they move on the job. And to the people wondering, have I left something out? The answer is, of course I have. Given everything I've told you, one of the alliances the labor movement has also now to think about is having a political party that is ready to fight for labor when it bargains collectively, but also for labor when it builds worker co-ops as an important weapon in its arsenal. Labor needs the alliance with a political party ready to do that. And neither the Republicans nor the Democrats have shown any ability, willingness, or interest in playing that role. The left wing of the Democratic Party, maybe. But the question is whether the labor movement can develop that wing into what it needs or has to look for another political party ally. These are momentous questions that will shape politics, ideology, and much else in the United States. They are being fought out in almost every workplace in this country where people are thinking about, wondering about, reading about, watching about all of these issues swirling around. And I've wanted to celebrate to honor the American working class this Labor Day month of 2023 by presenting this discussion of a resurging labor movement that has brought hope and real achievement to the country that needs it so badly at this time. Thank you very much for your attention. And of course, we'll be back here in November, second Wednesday of the month, as always, 7.30 p.m. And we will look forward to speaking with you again then.